taking the reading from verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of Him went out through all the surrounding region. And He taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So He came to Nazareth, where He had been brought up. And as His custom was, He went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And He was handed the book scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. May God bless his inspired word to our hearts today. As I've mentioned in our previous time, here we have described for us the commission of the Christ. Here is the beginning of the ministry of the Messiah after he was baptized in the river Jordan by John the Baptist, after he'd spent, led by the Spirit into the wilderness, the desert for 40 days and 40 nights where he fasted. And here it was in his hometown, Nazareth, that Jesus of Nazareth fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 61. We saw that he was able to say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. We saw that there in the Greek it means, is upon me. It remains upon me. Up to that point, the Spirit of the Lord came upon prophets, and people, and then went again. Came and went, came and went. But here for the first time, the Spirit of the Lord came and remained upon the Messiah. Because He has anointed me, Jesus was able to say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me. And in the Greek aorist tense, it means he's anointed me once and for all. And of course, we know that happened at the River Jordan. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. In the Greek, it literally means he's anointed me to evangelize the poor. He has sent me. He has sent me. And as a result, it means. I am now here because He has sent me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. It literally means He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. And that's where we left off the last time we were together. But here it goes on to say, We've come, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel, to evangelize the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives. To preach deliverance to the captives. Now the word preach here is different to the word preach a few lines before. The previous time it was to evangelize. But the word preach here simply means to announce. It means to declare. To declare and announce deliverance to the captives. And there, literally, the word deliverance means release. He sent me to announce and declare release to the captives. In Psalm 18 verse 2, David said, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. He's my God, my strength, in whom I will trust. He's my shield and the horn, my shield and the strength of my salvation. He's my stronghold. The Bible declares in the, the Gospel, the New Testament, John chapter 1, verse 17, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. You see, friends, the law, the law was good. Because what the law did was, the law highlighted our sin. 
The law actually condemned us. But the law by itself couldn't save anybody. It could simply point out our, our sin and our failings and it would condemn us. But the, but the reason for the law was to point us to another. Someone higher than the law. Someone who would fulfill the law and even more. Who was that? God's Son, the Messiah, Jesus. He came and fulfilled the law. And you see, friends, the law came through, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Notice that. The law was given. It was handed over by Moses. That's all he did. Because he didn't write the law. God did. He simply gave it. The law was given through Moses. But grace and truth wasn't given, but it was came through Jesus Christ. Did you get that? It came through Jesus Christ. Friends, no ifs, buts, or maybes. It came through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. That's where grace and truth came through. The Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus Himself said in John chapter 8, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Notice the emphaticness of again. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. There's no, no reason for doubt, no room for doubt there, friends. And the truth shall make you free. It was Jesus who said in that wonderful de declaration in John 14 and 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus is the truth. That's why again in John chapter 8, 36, Jesus said, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And friends, don't listen to those who doubt and say, well, you know, if you come to Jesus, well, you don't have to. No, listen. The Word of God is emphatic, friends. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, there's a lot of stuff in our lives that need to be sorted out and cleared up. That's fine. But as far as you're standing before the Lord, whom the Son sets free, is free indeed. And that's the freedom of God through Jesus Christ. There's a wonderful couple of scriptures I was looking at a few weeks ago. In Psalm 102, so we're looking at, he was sent to preach deliverance to the captives. It says in Psalm 102, verses 19 and 20, For he, God, looked down from the height of his sanctuary, from heaven the Lord viewed the earth, why? To hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those appointed to death. Isn't that amazing? Almighty God, the Creator, Look down from heaven to have a to view, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, and to loose those appointed to death. Now, of course, it's not simply referring to those literally were prisoners and those who were literally captives. But that was the case because then that was limited for just then, and it's only for that area, just literally physically prisoners, uh, captives, those who need to be delivered. But far more than that, speaking spiritually as well, which is a greater, a greater uh, realm there, friends, because Jesus, He came. And the Lord had already was preparing to hear the groaning of the prisoner and to loose those who were appointed to death. The Scripture declares in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15, it says, just as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, a simple statement meaning that, Every human child, when born in this world, they're born with a body, born with flesh and blood. That's what it's saying. And Jesus took upon himself exactly the same. He was born into this world as a baby. He took on human flesh. And the Bible says Jesus shared in the same. He was born the same way. So that through death, he might destroy the devil who had the power of death. And release, notice that, and release and deliver from those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage and slavery. That's why Jesus came. To declare, to announce release and deliverance to the captives. The Bible says in Revelation 1 and verse 5, it says, unto him, speaking of Jesus, unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. In the actual Greek, it's to him who loved us and loosed us from our sins in his own blood. We have been loosed. We've been released from our sins. Hallelujah. Only the Messiah could do that, folks. 
So there we have it. To preach, to announce deliverance and release to the captives. But furthermore, Jesus read, said, He has sent me to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Once again, this refers to both physically and spiritually. Because if it was just for the physical, it would be extremely limited. But this is to both physical and spiritual. The Bible says, He sent me to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. We read in Luke's Gospel, chapter 7, these words from verse 18. Then the disciples of John, that's the disciples of John the Baptist, reported to John concerning all these things. What things? All that Jesus was doing. And John, John the Baptist, calling two of his own disciples to him, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Now the reason why John sent his disciples and asked these questions because you remember John the Baptist's ministry, how he actually stood against the religious elite and how that he stood against the political system of that day. And he was saying, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every mountain shall be, shall be brought low, every valley shall be filled. He was speaking of what God was going to do in judgment. Remember what he said to the religious leaders who came to his water baptism in the River Jordan? He said, who has warned you from the, to, to flee from the wrath to come? What was that about? That was speaking of the second coming of the Christ, the Messiah. When God comes and judges the world. And so things were going on here. And John knew that Jesus was the Messiah. He knew he was the Messiah. But he was thinking, hold on a minute. Time's passing here. I, John had his own idea. He was starting to think of the flesh. And he was thinking that, you know, by now Rome should be overthrown because this is the Messiah. So he sent to his disciples, are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? There was doubt with John. When the men had come to Jesus, the two disciples, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you saying, are you the coming one or do we look for another? And that very hour, Jesus cured many people of their infirmities, their illnesses their afflictions, and evil spirits. And to many who are blind, he gives sight. Then Jesus answered and said to the disciples of John, Go and tell John the things you have seen and heard, that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have the gospel preached to them. He saw with their own eyes. And then report it back to John. You know the story, the account of Bartimaeus in Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, how that Bartimaeus, Jesus, was, was coming towards Jericho. And there by the wayside where there's this beggar man who was lying by the side of the road, Bartimaeus. And uh, he heard all this commotion. Crowds passing by. And he cries, what, what's going on? What's going on? He said, oh, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Instantly he cried out, Jesus! Son of David, have mercy on me. People going past were going, shh, be quiet. Don't trouble, don't trouble the master. He won't want to do anything with people like you. But the Bible says he cried out all the more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped, commanded, ordered him to be brought to him. What do you want me to do for you? Rabbi, that I may receive my sight. Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Your faith has saved you. And he saw and immediately got up and started following Jesus with the rest of the crowd. He went with Jesus. So physical sight is involved here as well. But also spiritual. Because we read in John's Gospel, chapter 9, here was an occasion when Jesus healed a man who was blind from birth. And this had never happened in the history of the world. He healed a man who had been born blind. But we're going to go further down, take it up from John chapter 9, verse 29, because what was happening was the religious leaders of the, 
the Jews, they were furious. What do you mean this man made you, made you see again? And they, they brought his parents in, interrogated them. They were scared of the religious leaders. They, were, they didn't want to be excommunicated from the temple. And they said, is this your son? He said, well, hey, he's old enough. Ask him yourself. They didn't want to get involved. And the amazing thing is, they began to rile this man and to revile him. And verse 29, it says, 28, they reviled the man and said, you are his disciple, but we're Moses' disciples. Notice, there's not smack of religious elitism and snobbery. Verse 29, we know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he's from. The man, he'd be, he'd be healed. The man answered and said to him, why, this is a marvelous thing. This is an amazing thing that you do not know where he is from, and yet he's opened my eyes. And then the man goes on to say, now we know that God does not hear sinners. He was playing them at their own game here. We know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does God's will, God hears that person. Since the world began, here we go, since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. And he finishes by saying this. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And then sadly it says, they answered, they answered and said to him, you were completely born in sins. They judged him unrighteously. Now, that's what happens with religious people. When they don't understand some, they go, oh, you're, you're in sin. You're, you're in sin. You've done something wrong. They did exactly the same. You were completely born in sins, and are, and are you teaching us? It says, and they cast them out. That means they threw them out, literally, but also means they excommunicated them from the temple. You're not allowed back in here again. And to a Jew, that was the worst thing you could do. But later on, you'll find that Jesus went and found them. He searched them out and said, don't you worry. I'm going to take care of you. But notice what it said. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. But this man had been healed of physical blindness, but far greater still, he was healed of spiritual blindness. Because later on, it said, uh, Jesus found him and it said to the man, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, you've both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. And he said, Lord, I believe. And the man worshipped Jesus. He, he came to Christ right away. He converted instantly by the Spirit of God. Right there. Jesus. Right away, he came to know Jesus. The Bible says, and recovery of sight to the blind. Luke chapter 6, verse 39. We read that Jesus spoke a parable to them and asked this question. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall into the ditch? Well, of course they will. But of course, Jesus is speaking spiritually. He was, he was giving them an illustration to emphasize a point. That's why Paul writes in his second letter to the church at Corinth and chapter 4 and writes from, from verse 4. He says, the God of this world is a, a title of Satan, the devil. The God of this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. Lest the light of the, of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Because we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. Because it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, friends, when God's light comes in, darkness goes. Instantly. Instantly. You go into a room, as soon as you turn on a flashlight, darkness goes. Because you've got the, the light, you switch on the light, it just, darkness goes. Same with spiritual, friends. When Jesus, when you ask Christ to come into your life by His Holy Spirit, it comes into your life, and when it's, it's the moment his light enters your darkened soul. Darkness goes instantly. Hallelujah. Darkness goes instantly. It's not a case of, well, there's darkness hiding somewhere. In the sense, when Christ comes, darkness goes. His light enters. It was Paul the Apostle when he 
stood and gave testimony and witness before King Agrippa in Acts chapter 26. And Paul was giving his testimony. I always encourage us to give our testimonies to people because no one can argue with that. You were there when it happened. And no one can argue with Paul. He was there when it happened. He was giving his testimony. Paul loved to give his testimony. There's three or four places in the New Testament where Paul gives his testimony. And the Bible says, that Paul says to Agrippa, he says, the Lord appeared to me on the road to Damascus. And this is what the Lord said to me. He said, Paul, I will deliver you. Literally in the Greek, I will rescue you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you, to the Gentiles. I will send you to the Gentiles. Here's the reason why I'll send you to the Gentiles, Paul. And I quote, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. So there we have it. And recovery of sight to the blind. Jesus came as part of his messianic ministry was to bring recovery of sight to the blind. But moving on, not only that, it was also to set at liberty those who were oppressed. To set at liberty those who were oppressed. Now the passage that Jesus read out from Isaiah, there in Nazareth in the synagogue, when you look back, when Jesus read that, when you look back at Isaiah, this phrase, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, actually doesn't appear in Isaiah chapter 61. In fact, this quote is taken from three chapters earlier. We know it as Isaiah chapter 58, verse 6. That's where it's based on. And so when, what happened here is that very often in, in, in Jewish religion, when they're reading the Scriptures, and what we would do is when they read something out, if something else came to their mind which was in keeping with the Scripture they were reading, they would bring it in and be part of, of the flow of Scripture. And Jesus brought that in because it was part of the flow of Scripture. So when Jesus said, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, what it literally means is, to send away ones having been crushed in release. That's what it means literally. To send away ones having been oppressed and crushed in release. And that's what Jesus came to do. To release, to set at liberty those who were oppressed. The word oppressed there, in the King James, it is bruised. It also means those who were smitten through. Those who were shattered. Those who were crushed. In other words, those who were broken by calamity. By unforeseen circumstances. By tragic situations. Those who were broken by calamity, Jesus said, I've come to release them. I've come to release and set them free from that experience. To set them free from that heartache and that terrible tragedy they went to. I've come to give them liberty in their spirit. That no longer will they be imprisoned and bound and influenced by that terrible thing that, went, that they went through in their life. Set at liberty those who were oppressed. David said in the ninth verse of Psalm 9, the Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed. I like that. The Lord will be a refuge for the oppressed. A refuge in times of trouble. Peter in the household of Cornelius declared in Acts chapter 10 verse 38 that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. That's why we read in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, from verse 28, Jesus said those wonderful, amazing, precious words, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He came to set at liberty those who are oppressed, bruised, and crushed. 
Jesus says, come to me. Friend, this morning, come to Jesus. That's where your situation will be remedied. That's where your need will be met. That's where all that you're looking for is found in the Christ, the Messiah Jesus. In the last part of the reading, it says to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Here we have that word again, preach. And this is the one that's used just before this. The same one, to announce and to declare. Jesus said, I've come to announce, to declare the acceptable year of the Lord. Acceptable means the favorable year of the Lord. The favorable year. And of course, it's, we know it, it's not a literal 12 months. There it, remain, it refers to a period of time. The favorable year. The favorable time of the Messiah. Of the grace of the Christ. It's referring to the favorable year. This favorable time period. We're still living in it. It's coming to a close. But we're still living in it now. That people can know the grace of Jesus Christ. And know salvation. And know forgiveness of sins. And so Jesus said to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And notice this. Then he closed the book. Of course, we know it was a scroll. Then he closed the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. I find this amazing. Notice that. He did three things. First of all, he closed the scroll. He rolled up the scroll again. He closed the book, okay? First thing he did. He gave it back to the attendant. He received the scroll from him. And Jesus sat down. Jesus, excuse me, you can't finish yet. The reading's not finished yet. You've, you've finished halfway through a statement. You cannot finish there. That's not the way things are done. It goes on to say, and the day of vengeance of our God. Thank God that Jesus, and thank Jesus that He stopped reading where He stopped reading. Because if Jesus had have read the next phrase, the whole world would have been under the judgment of God instantly. The whole world would have been judged and condemned at that time. But Jesus stopped. As they say probably halfway through a sentence almost. To preach, to declare the favorable and acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book. He rolled up the scroll. Can you imagine the confusion amongst the, the hearers? What's he doing? He just stopped in the middle of that. What for? I've no way. Now he's now he's rolling this scroll up. I thought he was maybe going to go back, but now he's rolling it up. And now he's even giving it back. He's done. He sat down. That's it. What's he playing at? This has been first time. Not only there, but any synagogue, for someone who did that particular reading, to stop where he stopped. But Jesus did that because he is the Messiah. He was referring to his first coming, his first period of ministry. When he came, remember what the Bible says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And this is why Jesus came the first time. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. He did not continue to read. And the day of vengeance of our God. Praise God, he didn't do that. Thank you, Jesus. To preach the acceptable and favorable year of the Lord. Listen to what the Bible says, friends, in the New Testament, in 2 Corinthians 6 and 2. It says, For the Lord says, Paul writes, For the Lord says, In an acceptable time, in a favorable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, says Paul, listen, behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the acceptable and favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Paul was emphasizing this period we're living in right now, this is the, this is the acceptable and favorable year of the Lord. And this is what's favorable. What is it? Now is the day of salvation. Paul referring to the Again, it wasn't a 24-hour period. This is the day. This is the period of the day of salvation. It's right now, and it's now. Paul was saying, you can come to Christ now. Salvation is available now. Not after the day of vengeance. Right? It's available now in this time period. And so Jesus read that scripture out. 
And what did he go on to say? The Bible says he, he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the tenant, sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. I guarantee they were. Can you imagine just all staring at him? It doesn't say, see, in the West we get this idea, Jesus read the scripture, and he did this, and I thought, oh, they'll step back. Isn't that lovely? He's one of our boys. He grew up here. He grew up, I used to play with my kids. Ah, oh, what a lovely man. That, didn't he read that beautiful? I've never heard it read so nice in all my life. It's just, it's just wonderful to hear this. And that's why they're all looking at him, just all googly eyed. That's not the reason their eyes were fixed on him. They were shocked. They were looking at him. You can imagine, they were staring, as we would say, what would we say, if Luke's could kill? <coughs> looking, staring at him. But this is what it says next. And Jesus began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. They never ever heard that before after the scripture. In fact, you'll read that a few verses down. What did they do? The people he grew up with, they took him to the brow of a hill. There's a, there was a, a bit of a cliff face in a part of Nazareth, old Nazareth there, and they were going to take him and throw him over and kill him. Because he said those, because he read that out, he closed up the scroll, and he said, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. To them it was, How, who do you think you are? Because they knew what that meant. They were saying, he's saying that he is the Messiah. They knew that. So there's no point in theologians arguing about, oh, that's not what he did. Yeah, the people knew it. They knew what that meant. He's saying he's the Messiah. How dare he? He grew up here. And they went to kill him. The Bible says, but Jesus, he turned and passed through the midst of the ball. He was in control. He knew exactly what he was doing. The commission of the Christ. So friends, in closing this morning, so as Jesus stood before the people in his hometown synagogue of Nazareth, he stood before the world. Listen to this. Even though he's standing in Nazareth, in the synagogue there, Jesus stood before the world as the evangelist. He stood before the world as the healer. He stood before the world as the emancipator. And announcing the beginning of his public ministry, in these terms, Jesus indicated its meaning and its method and its movement and its message. Remember again the words of Peter in Acts 10 and 38. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. That's the clincher, folks. Because God was with him. Remember the man... Nicodemus, a ruler of the synagogue, came to Jesus by night for fear of the Jews. He said, Rabbi, John chapter 3, Rabbi, we knew that you were a teacher come from God because, listen to this, no one can do these signs, no one can do these miracles that you do unless God is with him. Hallelujah. John chapter 9, verse 33, we talked about the man born blind, healed by Jesus. What did he say? He said, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. But God was with him. Jesus said in John 5 and 19, most assuredly, truly, truly, I say to you, the Son, the Son of God can do nothing by Himself but what He sees the Father do. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does in like manner. That's why Jesus said to the disciples in John 15 verse 5, Without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. John chapter 14 and verse 12, Jesus said these words to the disciples in the upper room. Most assuredly, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Notice that. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. Sadly, I've heard some, not only one or two, thank God, from years past, and say, there, the Word of God, Jesus said that we'll do greater works than He did. But they, they think, oh, we're going to do greater miracles than Jesus did. How can you get greater miracles than what Jesus did? 
raise people from the dead? I get better than that. People forget in the English language the word greater has more than one meaning. Not only does the word greater mean greater than in quality, but here's it, it means greater in quantity. And Jesus said, greater works than these you shall do. Why? Jesus was limited to one body when he was upon earth. He was about to send his disciples out into the world. He said, because there's going to be, you're going to be going out, and then you're going to be contacting others. And what will happen? People start to follow me, and it's going to spread and spread. And so there are going to be far many more works done than the ones that I've done in my lifetime. That's what it means. And greater works than these will you do because I go to my Father. You see, friends, Jesus was commissioned. Listen to this. Jesus was commissioned to commission his disciples for the Great Commission. Notice this. Remember what we said earlier in what Christ read out? Speaking of himself, because he fulfilled it. He has sent me. He has sent me. And as a result, I am now here. He has sent me. Let's think of it. God, God the Father, sent the Son. And when Jesus went back, God the Son sent the Holy Spirit. God is a sender. He loves to send. Do you know what? He loves to send blessings. He loves to send things that will bless us and encourage us and strengthen us. And friends, let me tell you, God sent the Son. The Son sent the Holy Spirit. And listen to this. And Jesus is here now by the power and presence of His Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit continues the ministry of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, to this day. Because all you've read there, people are still being filled with the Spirit to this day. People are still being anointed by the Spirit of God to evangelize the poor. People are still being healed. Those who are brokenhearted, their lives are being bound up. People are declaring and announcing to those who are bound in sin. He's come to preach release to the captives. Recovery of sight to the blind. Those who are blinded by sin and they can't see in front of them spiritually. But thank God, through God's servants and God's people. And remember, we're all God's servants, folks. Remember that. We're all God's servants. And we're able to bring recovery of sight to the blind. And we're able, with the power of the Holy Spirit, to see people set at liberty, be released, those who are crushed, bruised, and oppressed. Why? Because we're still living in the acceptable and favorable year of the Lord. Hallelujah. And it's going to be like that until the church goes to meet Jesus in the air. Then the acceptable year will end. And you know what comes next. The day of vengeance of our God. But folks, today, we're still living in the grace period of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Because as, when you put your trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit lives within us. A power that's within us, folks. It lives within us. You know what we're going to do this morning? We're going to close in a few moments. We're going to sing a great song together. He is here. Hallelujah. We're going to sing that. And as we sing it, as you've heard the Word of God this morning, the reason why Jesus came and the reason why He said, greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father because the Holy Spirit is here this morning to glorify Jesus and to benefit us as God's people. So we're going to stand and we're going to sing this song together. He is here. Let's